direct from our newsroom in New York, in color, this is the CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite and Eric Severide in Washington, Mike Stanley in Washington, David Culhane in Montreal, Murray Fromson in Wichita, Kansas, and Mike Wallace in New York. Good evening. Less than two weeks before the congressional elections, the Nixon administration has received an apparent setback in its battle against inflation. The Labor Department says the cost of living, which showed signs of settling down in August, resumed its upward motion last month at the rate of one-half of one percent. But in Washington, the administration claims things look worse than they actually are. Mike Stanley reports. The September adjusted figure for the Consumer Price Index represents a short-term setback for the administration fight against inflation. But several nationally prominent economists contacted by CBS News point out that such monthly fluctuations are not too significant. Rather, they say, a broader gauge, such as a quarterly figure, is more meaningful. And the rate of price increase has slowed from 6.3% to 5.8%, finally to 4.2% in the third quarter. This is the view stressed by President Nixon's chief economic advisor. I think the basic point to be, uh, bear in mind is this, that uh, no index ever changes very much from one month to the next. This time the index changed four-tenths of one percent from uh, last month, or from August to September. We still have unfinished business. On the other hand, we've made real progress, and, uh, and I'm... Uh, uh, I'm, I'm delighted to see the visible progress that we have seen through the year here. Democrats were quick to attack the administration for not stopping inflation, led by National Chairman Lawrence O'Brien, who said, the Nixon economic game plan now has collapsed. Two former top economic advisors also raised game plan questions. The Johnson administration's Arthur Oaken, asserting high unemployment and recession are too high a price to pay for stopping inflation. The Eisenhower administration's Raymond Saunier sees prospects for overcoming inflation as not promising and pinpoints administration fiscal policy as perfectly atrocious. His worry about federal deficits was echoed today in a Washington speech by the House Ways and Means Committee chairman Wilbur Mills, who predicted the 1971 fiscal year deficit will not be the $1.3 billion forecast by the administration, but rather between 15 and 16 billion. In my view, this situation is dangerous, not so much because of the actual size of the deficit in 1971, but more importantly, because the trend continues to be one of lack of fiscal restraint and lack of any control. As I've said before, this constantly increasing trend in federal expenditures will, if not reversed, or at least lessened, far exceed the growth in revenues generated by our tax system even in periods of high prosperity. I am deeply concerned about the future of my country as I look years ahead. If we do not do a better job and get to it immediately than we've done in the last 40 years. There would seem to be enough blame for the past 40 years to go around, but as Election Day approaches, each party is trying hard to marshal figures, pinning the biggest responsibility on the other party. Mike Stanley, CBS News, Washington. Chairman Mills also predicted this evening that Congress will pass a bill right after the election setting quotas on the imports of textiles and footwear despite threats of retaliation against U.S. products abroad. The stock market, which had rallied at the opening, fell off following that word of the new rise in the cost of living, leaving the averages virtually unchanged for the day. Volume on the New York Exchange was 11,300,000 shares. The average price per share fell one cent on the New York Exchange and four cents on the American Exchange. I'm a waitress, chef, chauffeur, teacher, lover, nurse. I'm a housewife. And I love it. I love what I do because I take good care of myself. I exercise, get plenty of rest, try to watch my diet. And to make sure I get enough vitamins and iron, I start every morning with a Geritol tablet. Geritol is one of the nice things I do for myself. And with all my jobs, I need all the help I can get. Geritol, one of the good things you can do for yourself. Hi there. So what's he doing in my shop with his electric razor and William's electric shave? Okay, so the electric shave does make your whiskers stand up. 
So it does lubricate your face and give you a close, comfortable shave. So? A shave that feels barber close with your electric razor? Sure enough. Look for the big L. First letter in. In Montreal today, the coroner issued his report on the murder of Quebec Labor Minister Pierre Laporte, and he said he had been strangled. The finding contrasted with earlier reports that Laporte had been shot. David Colhane has the latest developments in the Canadian terrorist kidnappings from Montreal. Police and soldiers continue to look for the killers of Pierre Laporte. And today, for the first time, officials revealed the cause of his death. Cause of death. As, acute asphyxiation by strangulation by means of a bond. This bond could be a small chain uh, which Mr. Laporte had around his neck and which was still in place at the time of the post-mortem. The, the marks traced of the strangulation was all around the neck except at the back of the neck where it uh, appeared that it had been twisted. Police later added that the murder weapon was a light gold chain that carried a religious medal. And all through the night, police were receiving anonymous telephone calls about the other missing hostage, British diplomat James Cross. Carloads of Canadian and Cuban officials went across the Concordia Bridge to the Expo 67 site, where the government has agreed that the kidnappers could place themselves in the hands of the Cuban Council and leave the country freely in exchange for the hostage. But police later arrested two persons and said that apparently all those who called saying they were holding cross were simply cruel hoaxers. And so the search goes on. David Culhane, CBS News, Montreal. Police in Santa Cruz, California, say that they're looking for three young hippie types, one a woman, as suspects in the murder of Dr. Victor Ota, his wife, two sons, and a secretary. The three wanted persons were seen yesterday afternoon about five miles from a railway tunnel where one of Dr. Ota's cars was later found burned out and abandoned. Three sets of barefoot footprints also were found near the car. I saw a funny new kind of pantyhose today with a funny name, Little Prune. Isn't that hysterical? <laughs> it stops being funny when you see the perfect fit. With Little Prune, you get a fit that lasts and lasts, not even a baggy knee. And that's not funny. That's great. Little Prune pantyhose. Little Prune. began the day in Wichita, Kansas, on that Colorado plane crash earlier this month that killed 30 football players and fans from Wichita State University. Murray Frompson reports. One of the key witnesses in the first day of hearings by the National Transportation Safety Board was the co-pilot of the ill-fated Martin 404 airliner. Among other things, Ronald G. Skipper testified he had only 30 hours of flying experience in such a plane. He testified about his role moments prior to the crash. I decided we might, it might be better for us to make a turn and told Captain Crocker that. I initiated a right turn of approximately 45 degrees change in heading, a medium bank turn, which in my mind is somewhere between 20 and 30 degrees. And as I was rolling out of this turn, Captain Crocker said, I've got the airplane. He initiated a left turn. The aircraft began vibrating. He put the nose down, and shortly thereafter, we crashed. Dan Crocker, the pilot, was killed in the crash that took 30 lives. 
One of the surviving football players provided a dramatic moment in the inquiry. Rick Stevens testified he sensed something was wrong just before the plane hit the hillside, and he went forward to the cockpit. He made a, a quick right turn, and then a, a sharp left. And uh, that's when I, I felt like the airplane started to drop. And uh, I started to run back into the passenger section, and uh, I was knocked to the floor. And uh, I, I felt, I remember, I felt the tip of the left wing. I felt the left side of the plane, was it a wing or not, I don't know, hit, hit or something. And uh, next thing I knew, I, was, I woke up, I was on the ground. And, uh, the federal examiners were also told that the plane, with its crew, equipment, and unsuspecting football players, was at least 3,500 pounds overweight on takeoff from Denver, just minutes before the tragedy. Murray Thompson, CBS News, Wichita, Kansas. Former Chief Justice Earl Warren, in a lecture at Kansas State University today, said that injustice to minorities is still the nation's number one problem, and that until they are eliminated, quote, nothing else will restore amity to our country. A special ethics panel of federal judges today cautioned their colleagues on the bench against sitting in cases involving firms in which they or their families have stock. Should such a case come before a judge, the panel said, he should immediately advise both sides and have nothing further to do with the case unless all parties ask him to sit. When Charlie finally moved that cabinet, you could see that floor had yellowed. So I got moving. I scrubbed off the old wax. Then I tried clear. It doesn't yellow. Afterwards, I felt proud. Clear. It never yellows. You're early. I know. Finished my shopping? Thought you could use some help. Oh, could I? The bridge club will be here any minute, and I'm just not ready. Relax. I'll finish dusting. Thanks. Good chance to try out this lemon pledge I just bought. Pledge comes in lemon, too? Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. da, da, da. Hey, look at it go. Cleans brighter than ever before and does so fast. Beautiful. Look at that shine. So waxy. The girls will think I've been waxing all day. And with Lemon Pledge, all I did was dust. We're here. For wax beauty instantly as you dust, every time you dust. Pledge, lemon or regular. Officials in Turkey say a plane carrying two U.S. Army generals on a tour of Turkish military installations is missing and believed to have crashed. They were identified as Major General Edward Scherer and Brigadier General Claude McQuarrie, Jr. They were regularly stationed in Turkey. There was speculation in Saigon today that the United States and South Vietnam would soon declare a unilateral ceasefire, but such reports were quickly denied by the White House. Presidential News Secretary Ronald Ziegler said, We plan no announcements beyond the ones we already have made on Vietnam. The speculation arose in Saigon when some South Vietnamese military sources claimed that they had received detailed orders on what to do if there is a unilateral ceasefire. Israeli Prime Minister Golda Meir, speaking today before the United Nations General Assembly, urged the Arab nations to negotiate a Middle East settlement without intervention by any outside powers. Soviet Foreign Minister Gromyko also addressed the General Assembly, and he and Mrs. Meir each reaffirmed the positions their countries have been taking blaming the other side for the breakdown in the peace talks. President Nixon has turned his back on New York Republican Senator Charles Goodell and indirectly endorsed his conservative opponent, James Buckley. New Secretary Ronald Ziegler noted that Buckley had supported the president on major issues while Goodell had not. Because of that, in Mr. Ziegler's words, the president will refrain from his usual practice of endorsing the Republican candidate. Ziegler also repeated President Nixon's endorsement of Governor Nelson Rockefeller for re-election in another New York race in which party lines have been crossed. That Campaign 70 story from Mike Wallace. The last time New York Governor Nelson Rockefeller and New York City Mayor John Lindsay appeared together was on Columbus Day. And at that time, there was still a political mystery. Would Republican Lindsay support Republican Rockefeller for re-election? Governor, I noticed you had a long-headed translation. Children, you'll be very supportive. <laughs> <laughs>
I should like to have it. I feel him tugging at my sleeve. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Evidently, the governor didn't tug hard enough. Lindsay, with his eye perhaps on other things, endorsed Rockefeller's Democratic opponent, Arthur Goldberg. The Goldberg campaign was lagging, and the Lindsay endorsement was time to give it a shove. Goldberg, a former Kennedy cabinet member, former Supreme Court justice, former U.N. ambassador, is considered a good shot at New York's big Jewish vote. His running mate for lieutenant governor is Basil Patterson, a black man who will help deliver the black vote. Those two liberal blocks in the past have gone mainly to Nelson Rockefeller. As a result, Rockefeller has had to go to the right for votes. He has put on a hard hat, climbed on a bulldozer, and gone looking for the support of those ethnic groups, Italians, Poles, Irish Catholic, and others, who, according to the Rockefeller surveys, are fed up with liberal notions of permissiveness about crime and drugs and black militants. Arthur Goldberg is cynical about Nelson Rockefeller's motives. And I think he moves in the direction in which his polls indicate popular opinion at the moment is. If public opinion is moving towards a liberal character, he moves that way. If it's moving conservative, he moves that way. I do not think that is the quality of leadership that is required in our society. But the hard hat and the uh, working men and women uh, were there before it became a symbol. And they were just as concerned about jobs and about the opportunity for their children, good education, as they are now. Mm -hmm. uh, they resent crime. They resent a lot of the things that are destroying the stability of the family. Well, I think most people do. What's happened is I've stayed in the center. There are major elements of the Democratic Party who have moved uh, to the new left. There is high unemployment in New York State as elsewhere, but Governor Rockefeller through the years has carefully courted New York's big labor organizations. He has won the support of the state AFL-CIO, and he's grateful. This is something I never expected as a Republican, as a minority party representative, to have. I have done what I felt was best over the years for the working men and women of this state and the people of this state. Goldberg, formerly the attorney for the steel workers as well as Secretary of Labor, is stung by the defection of official labor. But nonetheless, he professes optimism that the working man's vote will go to him. It's going to go because I've expressed myself on the state of the economy. And I've said what I think, that the economic uh, uh, operations of the federal government, approved by the governor, are a disaster for our country. For the working man, for businessman, unemployment is rampant, we still have inflation. That is what I think will determine that vote. There is a conservative party candidate for governor, Professor Paul Adams, who collected half a million votes four years ago when he ran for the same office. The fact is that the Conservative Party could hurt Rockefeller badly because the Conservatives have a popular candidate for Senator in James Buckley. And if enough Conservative Party levers are pulled for Buckley, Adams would be a coattail beneficiary. The Buckley candidacy and, indirectly, the Adams support were helped along by Vice President Agnew's repeated jibes at New York's Republican Senator Charles Goodell. Rockefeller was reported infuriated by Mr. Agnew's intrusion into the New York senatorial campaign. Do you rather wish that Vice President Agnew would be a little quiet? Well, he has been recently. At your suggestion, do you think that you got through to John Mitchell or the President and they told, uh, they told the Vice President that Nelson wants Spiro to shut up? Well, I don't know if that was the language that was used, but the message was, let us uh, work out our own problems here. Okay, now we better get this show on the <laughs> The polls showed Rockefeller well behind Goldberg when the campaign began, but with money, lots of it for television and radio, charm and hard work, the governor pulled way ahead. Now, private polls show Goldberg moving up again, and there's still a big percentage of undecided voters. Nothing like when there's a little uncertainty to have a good finger in your mouth, you know, that gives a little sense of security. Oh, nice young man. I don't want to miss anyone over here. How are you, sir? Good luck. Thanks, Laws. I need it, too, and I'm going to okay. work right down to the wire. Okay, I hope you do. By comparison, Goldberg is less at ease with people. Well, fellas, I can't do anything if I'm not in office except right. write editorials. <laughs> He's been called aloof. Some say he still comes over like a Supreme Court justice. See Of course, you like to be loved. Everybody does. I like to be. But I have not paid too much attention to that because I have thought 
that people will judge you ultimately for what you are. I am what I am. Now, for example, my aloofness, pomposity. I was aloof when I was on the Supreme Court. That is correct. What do you expect a Supreme Court justice to be? You want him to be a crony? Certainly not. But for 25 years, I represented fellows who worked for a living. I mixed with them. I sat in their meetings. I don't yield to the governor knowledge of human beings or capacity to get along with them. So that uh, I will have to be what I am in campaigning. And I will not change. The Goldberg campaign has had trouble raising money. The Rockefeller campaign obviously hasn't. The Goldberg campaign organization is at best sluggish. The Rockefeller crowd is slick, professional. The feeling among political observers is that Governor Rockefeller will be re-elected. But the folks here inside Goldberg headquarters keep on insisting that in this state where Democrats outnumber Republicans by more than half a million, Democrat Goldberg will wind up governor on election day. Mike Wallace, CBS News, New York. A one-day stewardess strike against Transworld Airlines ended this morning with tentative agreement on a new contract. President Nixon has signed into law legislation authorizing $2,700,000,000 in federal aid to the U.S. shipping industry. Among other things, the measure includes subsidies for the construction of 30 cargo ships a year for the next 10 years. In Mr. Nixon's words, this measure will make American shipping first in efficiency and capability. The 1970 Nobel Peace Prize was awarded today to Dr. Norman Ernest Borlaug, an agronomist from Iowa whose work in developing hardier and more productive types of wheat has meant bigger crops in have-not countries around the world. One of those is Mexico, where Borlaug now works. According to the U.S. Department of Agriculture, Mexican farmers, by turning to so-called miracle strains of wheat, have increased production by six times in 20 years and made Mexico self-sufficient in this vital crop for the first time. Borlaug is personally given much of the credit for that progress. A Texas scientist reported today that there is so little nutrition in commercial and enriched bread that it won't keep a rat alive. Dr. Roger Williams said he fed nothing but uh, this bread to 64 rats, uh, and, uh, and within 90 days, 40 of them starved to death. Small amounts of nutrients were added to the bread diet of 64 other rats, and only three of them died. The Federal Food and Drug Administration says it plans to advise doctors to curb the use of tobutamide, trade name Oranase, the drug most widely prescribed for diabetics. The government bulletin will be based on a private study last May, which indicated the drug really does little good and may be related to an increase in heart disease. We tried more toothpaste, but crashed with that fluoride. It worked. The others didn't have it. That's what a toothpaste should do, Rosie. Fight cavities. Fighting cavities is the whole idea behind Crest. Frankly, the only reason I tried Tide was because it came packed in my new General Electric washer. Listen to Mrs. Boyum and talk about Tide XK. Then when I saw how beautifully Tide cleaned Eric's play clothes, even the sneakers, I decided to keep using it. Tide XK comes packed in every GE with its mini basket for small loads. Honestly, I've never been so pleased with my wash. In Northern Ireland, Roman Catholic civil rights leader Bernadette Devlin was released from jail today after serving four months of a six-month sentence. The prison term for inciting riots two summers ago was shortened for good behavior. In northern, in, in Algiers today, uh, Black Panther leader Eldridge Cleaver said that Bernadine Dorn, a leader of the radical weatherman group who is on the FBI's most wanted list, has joined those who have escaped to Algeria. But some confusion has arisen tonight as to whether Ms. the Miss Dorn reported to be in Algeria is really Bernadine or her younger sister Jennifer. The answer should come tomorrow when Cleaver says Miss Dorn and LD, uh, LSD advocate Timothy Leary, who escaped from a California prison last month, will appear at a news conference in Algiers. 
The Soviets aren't saying why they waited a day before announcing that they started another unmanned flight around the moon, but their latest, Zone 8, blasted off yesterday. It's expected to go around the moon Saturday, taking pictures and recording other information, and return to Earth next Tuesday, if all goes well. In his latest comments on television news, Vice President Agnew mentioned Eric Severide, among others, by name. Tonight, Eric replies. The Vice President proposes that network commentators like this one and Brother Smith and Reynolds down the street at ABC, people of that type, he says, be publicly examined by government personnel. The public has a right to know, he says, our opinions and prejudices. The phrase people of that type hurts a bit. We certainly don't think of Mr. Agnew as a type. We think he's an original. But what really hurts is the thought that maybe nobody's been listening all this time. If after some 30 years and thousands of broadcasts, hundreds of articles and lectures and a few books, one's general cast of mind, warts and all, remains a mystery, then we're licked, and we fail to see how a few more minutes of examination by government types would solve the supposed riddle. Mr. Agnew wants to know where we stand. We stand, or rather sit, right here in the full glare, at a disadvantage as against politicians. We can't cast one vote in committee, an opposite vote on the floor, can't say one thing in the north, an opposite thing in the south. We hold no tenure, four years or otherwise, and can be voted out with a twist of the dial. We cannot use invective and epithets, cannot even dream of impugning the patriotism of leading citizens, cannot reduce every complicated issue to yes or no, black or white, and would rather go to jail than do bodily injury to the English language. We can't come down on this side or that side of each disputed public issue because we're trying to explain far more than to advocate, and because some issues don't have two sides. Some have three, four, or half a dozen, and in these matters we're damned if we know the right answer. This may be why most of us look a bit frazzled, while Mr. Agnew looks so serene. Another reason may be that we have to think our own thoughts and write our own phrases. Unlike the Vice President, we don't possess a stable of ghostwriters. Come to think of it, if there are mysteries around, unseen spirits motivating the public dialogue, maybe that's the place that could use the glare of public scrutiny. That stable of anonymity. And finally, at the risk of sounding a bit stuffy, we might say two things. One, that nobody in this business expects for a moment that the full truth of anything will be contained in any one account or commentary. But that through free reporting and discussion, as Mr. Walter Lippman put it, the truth will emerge. And second, that the central point about the free press is not that it be accurate, though it must try to be, not that it even be fair, though it must try to be that, but that it be free. And that means, in the first instance, freedom from any and all attempts by the power of government to coerce it or intimidate it or police it in any way. And that's the way it is, Wednesday, October 21st, 1970. This is Walter Cronkite, CBS News. Good night. New low-tar multifilter. With only 14 milligrams of tar and 1.1 of nicotine, as compared to all U.S. government-tested cigarettes, which range from a high of 31 milligrams tar, 2.2 of nicotine, to a low of 2 milligrams tar, 0.1 of nicotine. New low-tar multifilter with activated charcoal. A low-tar cigarette with a tobacco man's kind of flavor. Consider it. From the Smoky Mountains to the Cumberland Ridges Through the rolling hills and Music City Across the cotton fields that reach the river From Mountain City to the Memphis Delta From the northern boundary to Hamilton County Whitfield Dunn's the man for you and me For all Tennessee it has to be done Winfield Dunn for governor then the CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite. The illegal recruiting of farm laborers from Mexico on the storefront lawyers tonight at 7.30, 6.30 Central Time on CBS. Local antitrust action against the oil companies. Details coming up next on Channel 5 News.